Let's pray. Heavenly Father, water us with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You hear me quote Pastor Frederick Beekner an awful lot. He's an author and theologian who helped me figure things out because he looks at the world differently than most people. He looks at the world, in my opinion, the way that the prophets did in the Old Testament. In his book, Wishful Thinking, he made a bold suggestion. Don't start looking in the Bible for the answers it gives. Start by listening for the questions it asks. And then he threw out a whole bunch of questions for you and I to get started with. Adam, where are you? Or Adam, Volbistu, Genesis 3.9. Am I my brother's keeper? Genesis 4.9. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, then requoted by Jesus. Who is my neighbor? Luke 10. What did you go out into the desert to see? Matthew 11. What are you looking for? John 1. What is truth? John. What questions do you have for God? Do you think anybody has ever asked those questions before? Parables are questions in reverse. Stories where Jesus gives the answer and then lets you put together the question. What really matters is matching our question to the answers. And not our answers, but God's answers. And if we ask the wrong question, let's face it, we're going to get the wrong answer. But if we listen carefully to the answers we learn to ask enough questions so we may finally come upon the question that we needed to ask. Man goes out to scatter seed. Some of the seed falls on the sidewalk, some on rocky soil, some among the thorns, and some in good soil. So why is the man scattering the seed? Why isn't he more careful? Three out of the four places where he scatters it, the seed is wasted. Why? Is he so rich that he can afford to waste seed? Is he a brand new farmer, doesn't know what he's doing? What kind of seed is it? Is it GMO? What's the normal return on the seed? Is there a better seed? What if instead of scattering it, we get a Lamborghini tractor? By the way, Lamborghini originally made tractors and they still do, so not just race cars. We used it to plant the seed because by the way, it's totally computer controlled. Those are just a few of my questions. I bet you've got some others. The other day, by the way, two songs got stuck in my head on repeat. I, I just couldn't get rid of them. I knew they weren't there on accident, and the only way that I was going to get them out of my head was to figure out why they were there. One of the songs was, Those Were the Days, My Friend. Yeah, a 60s ballad based on a Russian folk song. The other one was, The Ants Go Marching Two by Two, Hurrah. Oh, oh and just so you know, it was being sung in my head by a very large, strong male chorus. The ant song was actually simple. We had listened to it over and over again in the truck while we were driving through the Grand Tetons a few weeks ago while my granddaughter slept. Yep, quick zoom with my granddaughter where I sang the song to her and it was gone, replaced by her smile and memories of our hikes in the mountains. So one down, one to go. Those were the days, my friend, was a bit harder. Why this song and why now? started thinking of questions, anything that came to mind. I probably hadn't thought of this song in 30 years, might not have even heard it in 30 years. I remember it on the radio when I was a kid, kept asking question after question until it came to me. I sang this song in the choir in the ninth grade at Merrill Junior High School. Standing next to me, by the way, Eric, still a friend. Eric just retired because of cancer. He's traveling the world. And uh, I've been following him on Facebook. Quick message to him, letting him know that I'm still praying for him. That I can't wait to hear the stories when he's done traveling. And song two was gone. Replaced by a dozen memories of days long ago when I was in junior high school. I know the parable of the sower shows up every three years like clockwork. But I also believe that there's a reason that it's today in our lessons. I think God's trying to talk to us. And it's not just a casual, so how about those rainbow warriors? Or have you tried the new Kit Kat soy sauce candies? Oh, yeah. 
God enjoys casual conversation, but I also believe that he would like us to walk away from our time in church actually learning something, something that's worthwhile, something that we can carry with us, as Eldon Weisheit used to say, a spiritual doggy bag. If you look around the sanctuary, who do you see? And by the way, your sanctuary is wherever you are listening or watching this. Who do you see around you? See, from my vantage point, I see very different people that all have one thing in common, Jesus. Now, the people around you and the people that will be in the sanctuary, they all have other things in common as well. But, but the one thing that we all have in common is Jesus. So look around you. Look with more than just your eyes. Hear not just the words spoken, but the words that aren't spoken, that, that probably should be. Pay attention to the way people dress, the way they use their hands, their eyes, how they stand, how they sing. See, here's one of the things I know. Everyone around us is going through a battle that we don't know anything about. And all of us have a story, an amazing story, if we just get the chance to tell it. COVID changed the way we do things, like what we're doing here. Yeah, five years ago, if you'd said, hey, pastor, would you like to be online? I would have said, sure, but we never would have gotten around to it because well, let's face it, it, it's complicated, and it's not the way the church usually does things. But in truth, those changes were already taking place. COVID just sped it up. Literally, it jumped us a decade in so many things. Social media, living on our phones, instant access to everything, supply chains, challenges, the world getting bigger but also smaller at the same time, social justice, politics, social and personal isolation. There's a new normal we're settling into, and it's marked by less hugs, hesitation before handshakes, fewer people in person, more people staring at screens, awkward conversations, personal hygiene challenges. We all see and experience things just a little differently these days. If the news is an accurate mirror of the world's soul, there is less joy and a lot more judgment. It seems that there are some people who have nothing better to do than hold court from their bedrooms, kitchens, bathrooms, and lanais. They have a long list of things that the world and their neighbors need to change and get right. See, it's amazing how social media and hiding behind an email address that you made up makes you an expert on all things. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany just before World War II. As war broke out, he chose to return to Germany from the safety of the United States where he had been lecturing. But he returned because he would not abandon his congregation. Since he would not bow before Hitler or the Nazi party, he was imprisoned and he was ultimately killed for his faith. While he was in prison, he wrote some of the deepest and most needed treatises on the church and on the human condition. And I think the thing that was most amazing, despite all that he went through, he never lost hope in Jesus or the church. Bonhoeffer noted there were two trees in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the original choice before Adam and Eve, which is the same choice that is before you and I, is whether we wish to know God and the good life he created for us, period, or if we want to try and be like God and judge what is good and what is evil. And because we are judgy people, we always choose the latter. It's called original sin. We think we are smart enough, good enough, that we actually know better than God. We should probably rethink that, but we're not that smart. And this is where we finally get to our text for today, the parable of the sower. And if you remember all the questions I asked a few minutes ago, there is one question that I didn't ask, alluded to, but didn't quite get there. Why is the farmer satisfied with a 75% failure rate? I mean, how many of you would go into a new business if you knew that 75% of your work was going to be wasted? I mean, that leads us to another question. Is there anything we can do to improve the odds? The obvious answer is to not scatter seed on the sidewalk among the rocks or thorns. But that's a bigger issue that we're going to deal with in just a moment. It's a God thing, and I'm getting ahead of ourselves. A long time ago, when I was attending what was then called Concordia Teachers College in Seward, Nebraska, we had a large commons area between the buildings. 
It was a wide open grassy area bordered on four sides by sidewalks. Because over a thousand college students had to get from one building to another, and we all know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, well, in this case, it required leaving the sidewalk and walking across the grass, which created a large X in the middle of this grassy courtyard, which simply turned to mud and dirt. Every year, the maintenance group would put up barriers and replant the grassy area and put signs up that said, stay on the sidewalks. My last year at Seward, we got a new president. He did the absolute craziest thing. He had them put in a sidewalk in the form of an X in the middle of this grassy courtyard. I mean, who would have thunk? It's time to catch up with God and see what questions he might have thunk up as he wrote this parable. According to the Pew Forum, the most recent statistics show that 31.5% of the world claim to be followers of Jesus. If you read the fine print, they know this is based on estimates because it's actually impossible to take a worldwide survey. The number could be as low as 25%. Wait a minute, I've heard that number before. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. 75% of the world is not currently followers of Jesus. Now I remember. It's that whole parable of the sower, which, by the way, I've renamed the parable of the soil. See, if we reread the parable and see it not in terms of percentages, but in terms of areas in our world where it is very hard for the gospel to reach, it might open our eyes. Then, by the way, we can actually think of people a lot closer to home, friends and family members, people that we work near, neighbors, whose lives have been scarred by pain, disease, divorce, abuse, poverty, and a million other things that make it very hard for them to listen to the gospel, let alone allow it into their heart. First thing I did when I read the parable was judge the soil, sidewalk, weeds, rocks. It's all junk places that even I would know better than to plant seed. 75% most likely failure rate is unacceptable by our, by our standards. I mean, let's face it, I won't even accept a 99.999% failure rate when it comes to air travel. And that's exactly the point Jesus is making. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have life everlasting. It, it didn't say God so loved the 25% or the 31.5% or even the 50%, 75% or the 99.99999%. God so loved the world, 100% of it. See, even in the midst of a thorny, rocky world that has been paved over with sin as people run wherever they want, God is still sowing a life-saving, soul-saving word. And he is sowing it indiscriminately, just scattering it everywhere, like he doesn't understand the basics of farming. I mean, hasn't God ever taken a class on economics? I mean, if he had a Lamborghini tractor with the computer that does all of this and figures out the soil and the water and the furrows and everything, it would have kept the seed right where it needed to be. You know, the craziest questions that I came up with was what would happen if it started to rain and all that seed actually sprouted and grew and overcame the rocks and the thorns and covered the sidewalks? I mean, think about a church filled with people. And I don't mean one church, I mean all the churches. You see, the thing we call the word, the gospel or good news, is not limited to churches or denominations or religious institutions or pastors. It's not locked up in some seminary basement or dusty library. The word is anything and everything that brings good news to the poor, comforts those who mourn, heals the brokenhearted, opens prisons, resurrects the dead, brings hope and peace to those who think they have been forgotten. And I suppose following St. John's opening remarks in his gospel, the gospel ultimately is what brings light to the darkness. And, and the darkness, no matter how hard it tries, can never, ever, ever overcome the light because the light is that powerful. God's word is scattered all over. It comes in your tears, your laughter, your singing, your prayers. It even comes in your silence. Whenever you encourage someone or love someone or cry with someone or, or offer to help someone or let someone use your shoulder to lean on, you're scattering the seed of the gospel. You didn't conduct some kind of soil management survey to determine if it was worth your time and effort. You did what you did out of love. 
which puts a whole new spin on this parable. The ridiculous and extravagant sowing of seed because our God is a God of miracles and love. He, he will not let rocks or sidewalks or thorns get in the way of reaching a heart and life that is in pain or needs healing or is lost or feels like the world just doesn't care. Reminds me of a father standing at the gate of his home waiting for his prodigal son to return. And when he sees his son in the distance, the father forgets who he is and runs willy-nilly down the road, whooping and hollering because, well, the lost is found and the dead is alive again. Life is just too short, too sacred, and too important not to take chances, especially when it's a soul that's in the balance. If we believe the news and faces of those in the cars on the H1 and the people in line at the store, we live in a very serious and fearful time. A time where everyone should be very careful about wasting seeds of life and joy. They are to be hoarded. They are to be sacred just to yourself. But you know, you and I can choose to be different. To scatter our seeds of love and joy and peace and forgiveness willy-nilly, running down the road, whooping with joy, just like the prodigal father. If you need a reason, first, turns out we have an unlimited supply of peace, joy, love, and grace. You see, the only restrictions on love, joy, peace, and forgiveness are restrictions that we put on it. God says the heavens abound with such things. Second, what do we have to lose? 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh, and don't forget the Old Testament lesson where God says, My word will not return to me empty. It will accomplish whatever it I sent it for. So it turns out there are a bunch of empty pews and churches and all over the world. And I know there's plenty of room in heaven. There will be those who will reject God's love. But our job? Our job is to make it really, really hard for them to do so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.